bro. Do you remember Christina? She used to babysit you guys when mom was getting her master's. Look, her husband Chris is looking to buy a new car, and he knows you like cars, so he was wondering what you would suggest. He's been looking at a Volkswagen Golf, but Christina doesn't think it's a good idea because he just had surgery for a hernia, and he always wears his seatbelt uh, way too tight. So she's afraid that if he's going too fast, that when he stops, it's going to undo the surgery and he'll be back in the hospital. And he just got out. So uh, he really wants the Golf, but Christina doesn't know what other car to suggest, so he doesn't end up in the hospital again. Um, you know, because he had that crash that one time in the Honda, and she says he still hasn't gotten over it. Hi, it's Brian. Uh, we'll get back to Nick in a second. Just to remind you that the giveaway for this beautiful 2002 Honda S2000 is still going on. And this is your reminder to click on the link in the description, buy a mug or a digital download, and someone, maybe you, is going to win their very own S2000. Thank you so much for supporting regular car reviews. And now, back to Nick. I specifically picked this car from the email submissions on the premise that there was no way, no way that I would like this. Mainly due to the reputation of PA dubbers, the downpiping, clutch dumping overlords of the Northeast Extension, guys who downloaded chocolate starfish and the hot dog flavored water off of Kazaa, and then loaded that bad boy up into Winamp, and then went to Outback and ordered a steak medium well, and then got mad because it came back tougher than Teddy Roosevelt. The kind of guy who still finds a way to be disappointed when things go exactly the way he wants them to. The kind of guy who flips you off for slowing down at a yellow light. <sighs> but if you think about it, the notion that the golf succeeds because of these men, indeed, that enough of these men even exist to be statistically significant to this car's bottom line seems entirely implausible when you consider the bizarre reality the Golf occupies. This is not only the most popular Volkswagen, it's the third most popular car in the entire world behind the Corolla and the Ford F-Series. Although I think one of the Teslas might have actually surpassed it by now, but what's crazy is that this has enjoyed a longevity and success that not many cars have ever achieved, yet it seems rare for people to ever actually leave this car the way it is. You can't just have a Golf. You gotta have an ECU tune and a DSG tune, and if at least one of them isn't by integrated engineering, we're starting this build over again. You gotta have the catted downpipe or the catless exhaust and, and, and the carbon fiber intake and the carbon fiber rear spoiler, and you, you, you gotta get them Solo Works coilovers, and you gotta wrap the body with Barney the Purple Dinosaur Pearl Metallic and the LED undercarriage lights. And the subwoofers, because if Party Rock is in the house tonight, then Party Rock needs to live in all of our hearts. The Golf is popular because while it's a perfectly fine car when left stock, it's customizable and rearrangeable, sort of like siblings at an all-you-can-eat buffet trying to outdo each other at the dessert bar. It's fun because the Golf challenges you to show up and show out. But this right here, this is different. Is the Volkswagen Golf GTI Autobahn really everything it needs to be without modification? Or is it a good car that could achieve greatness with just a bit more work? I'm the Roman, this is Race to the Bottom, and today we drive the 2018 Volkswagen Golf GTI Autobahn as we continue our search for the worst cars in the world. You had your golf, you got the same old GTI you had last year. <laughs> Terrible. Volkswagen Golf GTI Autobahn. It goes from zero to dubstep in six and a half seconds. This is mostly stock, so it should be boring, right? It should have none of the charm or appeal of your typical modded Golf. I mean, I feel like the fact that it's an automatic would mean even PA dubbers would take issue. But how much of the appeal of a Golf is rooted in buying a car that you can enjoy from the start, 
versus getting a canvas on which to paint a masterpiece of excess. Well, I'm sure Volkswagen knows what owners are doing to these cars, what modifications they're performing, what quality of life improvements they're making. And Volkswagen isn't going to make those changes from factory, because not making them hasn't appeared to hurt sales. In fact, I don't even think it hurts the Golf from a critical standpoint, because people who review these cars seem to have a pretty good grasp of what they're getting into when they sign up for it. Present company excluded. There's an argument to be made for judging a car on its own merits rather than expecting butterflies and being disappointed you didn't fall in love at first rev. It's true of relationships, too. I mean, look, Rachel, it doesn't have to be today, and it doesn't even have to be tomorrow, but at some point, you need to stop falling in love with the process of falling in love and learn to be by yourself for a while. This is all just a long way of saying that the VW Golf GTI Autobahn is a fine car just the way it is. Ugh, look, it brings me no pleasure to be entering month six of positive reviews for a show dedicated to finding bad cars. But a good car is a good car, even if it is the official car of shift managers at Buffalo Wild Wings. Oh, Rachel's just waiting for Josh to get home, and oh, here he is, but wait, no, he's going into the bathroom to drop a rock of ages because nothing screams working man like spending so much time on the john you start having all your meals delivered there along with conjugal visits if getting your order wrong had a face and four wheels it'd be a volkswagen golf it has the same face as a toddler filling their diaper after you've just changed them looking you dead in the eyes what are you going to do about it that's right you're gonna change me. Again. You're gonna keep changing me until I get tired of shitting. Now fetch me a bottle all! And I know, but who's buying a golf for appearances, right? Odds are you're going to give it a makeover anyway. But, again, this is stock. And in a way, it's helping me to understand why people modify these cars to the extent that they do. If I had the money to modify my boring-looking Camry, I absolutely would. So I can't exactly fault anybody for adding a bit of pizzazz wherever possible. Now let's get under the hood. This offers a 2-liter turbo 4, making around 220 horsepower and 258 pound-feet of torque. Not good enough? Go find a box that promises 10 more horsepower and see how that plays in the Commonwealth. You get the 6-speed dual clutch and fuel economy in the neighborhood of 25 City and 33 Highway. As Jake explained to me, he purchased this for practical reasons. He's a sociable guy, but his Honda CRZ wasn't exactly the most inclusive car in the world, considering the lack of a back seat. He wanted something pragmatic and fun for a decent price, and since he had already previously owned two other GTIs of the Mark VII generation, he decided to re-up for the hat trick. The only downside, it seems is that he couldn't find one with a 1.8, because you can't really get those anymore. If you want a plain old run-of-the-mill Golf, and you don't find one on the used market, well, too bad. It's either drive a GTI, or you're not driving a Golf at all. So now Jake is stuck with a bunch of horsepower he doesn't really need, because why does anybody really need a hatchback that cries out for time attack tires? Who would even need a hatchback like that? Well, enthusiasts, mostly. But also people looking to thread the needle between an affordable, reliable daily driver and a track car that can actually make you forget that hitting red line on the morning commute just means you're making your workday 20 minutes longer. While filming on the road, Jake had to hold this in fifth to keep from pulling too far ahead of the Forerunner. And I'm sure that says as much about how slow the 4Runner is as it does how fast the Golf is, but while driving this myself, uh, I can't say I was surprised by the ease of acceleration. I guess I was also surprised by the absence of lag. Everything felt consistent, right down to the impressively taut handling, and a suspension that was always dependably firm, name of my sex tape. This is no waterbed suspension, and I would hope not, considering how many decades Volkswagen had to get this right. 
I don't know if you would necessarily call the golf a successor to the Beatles since they existed concurrently, but they're often referenced alongside one another, with the golf serving as something of a replacement for the Beatle. A successor by way of difference. A front-engined, front-wheel drive car in comparison to the rear-engined, rear-wheel Beetle of the time. Europe got it in 1974, while North America would get it in 1975 under the name The Rabbit. At least until the second generation a decade later, at which point it became the Golf here, too. But by any name, it was a success, with a 1.8 liter four-cylinder coupled with the everyday versatility of a hatchback and the nimble proportions of a sportier vehicle. The Golf thrived largely on its ability to become whatever the driver needed it to be. It could be a family car, a bachelor's daily, or something punchier, more exciting, as the 1.8 offered just the right amount of power for straddling the line between running errands and breaking laws. And in the decades ahead, the Golf would gradually evolve into what we see today, gaining a larger variety of engine options over time, and variants like the Golf R and the Sport Wagon, to add to the concept that driving a hatchback didn't have to mean being locked into a life of grocery store runs and dropping the kids off at college. These cars were getting younger, appealing to a more youthful demographic, while also remaining popular among the disposable income bracket who viewed these as perfect project cars, because modification possibilities were endless no matter what engine you ended up with. But a late cycle refresh at the tail end of 2018 saw the displacement drop down to a 1.4 liter turbo to where you couldn't really get a 1.8 anymore. And I suppose the rationale was simply that the base Golf wasn't competitive with your Toyotas and your Mazda 3s in North America, because they were too expensive to maintain. And I kind of get that, because looking in this engine bay, not everything is easy to get to. The ABS is all the way in back, and the master cylinder and boost are like trying to get at organs. This, I hate this. Freaking Torx bolts just to clean... Change the box the filter. Just to change your air cleaner. Yeah. Like, how much do you want me to not work on this car? Yeah. Interesting, that's there. Man, and your booster, ugh. Your master cylinder is way down there, the brake booster is way under there. Means all this has to come off. Your battery has to come out in case you need to change your master cylinder. Hmm. Mitt Silly Cat. Mitt Silacat. I mean, this sounds like a, a deviant art artist that just draws Sephiroth porn. If you're not doing the maintenance yourself, I, you can just see the labor costs mounting on these cars. Now, luckily for Jake, he hopefully won't have to worry about all that anytime soon, since this currently only has around 27,882 miles as of filming. And it drives like a car with tons of life ahead of it. In addition to stuff like heated seats and all the stuff that you get on the SE trim, the Autobahn comes with adaptive dampers, along with limited slip and some stronger brakes, and you can actually feel the difference in how it handles. I felt like I was driving a car that was more expensive than an MSRP around $35,000. It was responsive, even if these aftermarket tires hampered performance a bit. You see, Jake had gotten these awful aftermarket winter tires, which, by his own admission, were the result of basically misjudging the type of winter tires he would need. It was so bad that he actually called the shop so he could have them swapped out on the way home from filming. And so while the brakes are great, the tires felt like an overcorrection for a problem that didn't exist. Now, even with those tires, the suspension did keep things relatively smooth, even on these miserable cratered roads. And while this Turbo 4 offers more power than I'd normally use, it was encouraging to find that steep hills didn't provide any sort of challenge. I found myself having a good time. This will pretty much blaze off of a dead stop. It's torque-tastic. Seriously, I wish I could say that this was as bad as you'd think from seeing other golfs do burnouts at a car meet outside of Hardee's, but I actually kind of wish I had more time with this than the afternoon that I had. 
Now, of course, it has some weird imperfections. For example, the coin slots are only big enough for euros. One quarter will be really loose. Two won't fit. And you can try shoving them in there, but they'll just fall out like a prolapse butt plug. And the interior is kind of whatever. Like, it's fine. You know, it's not going to be the most dynamic interior in the world, but it was comfortable for what it was, and it didn't feel overly cluttered and like an eyesore. But, you know, it. I keep coming back to wondering the extent to which cosmetic appearance even factors in to the decision to purchase a car like this in the first place. Provided that the average owner is just going to modify it anyway, how much cosmetic refinement do you really need? More than a car that comes with its own style imprinted for the owner's benefit, the Golf wants you to stake a claim on what it is, to generate meaning and value in what you do with it. Because here's the thing. Cars are the social capital of the world, and they have been since their invention. They signify status, they signify access to social areas to which we've been barred. You know, when you're in school, all the popular kids are the ones who get their licenses first, the ones who have cars, the ones who can drive, who can take you places and don't need to be chaperoned there by an adult. And that's if you even had an adult to take you there at all. I mean, not every teenager knows Drake. As with a lot of things, cars have a barrier of entry because once certain cars are obtained, they fundamentally alter our ability to perceive a person in a vacuum. Cars perpetuate unconscious biases that we don't intend, but which still manifest through our perception of what a person is capable of owning by what they've shown to be capable of driving. I mean... Why are golfs so popular among young men? They're affordable, they're fun, and they're customizable, yes, but it's also because the barrier of entry is lower. You can't gatekeep a Volkswagen Golf because there's no gate to keep, and if anyone is keeping the gate, they're easily bypassed, like so many rev limiters. The Golf is a jack of all trades. You can take this to the track and to the grocery store. You can do burnouts and band practice pickups. You can do highway pulls and take corners like a kid who just saw a pan of brownies. Maybe it doesn't do each of those individual things to the best possible standard, but at a sub $40,000 price point, it's impressive that it does so many things as well as it does. Because I really don't think you need to modify this car beyond quality of life upgrades and things that will make maintenance easier over time. Modifications that are more about increasing longevity rather than performance. When you hear that the Volkswagen Golf is one of the most popular and best-selling cars in the history of the auto industry, you might question how that's even possible. But realistically, you might feel the same way about the Dave Matthews Band. In a way, the Volkswagen Golf is the Dave Matthews Band of the auto industry. They were recently announced as one of the inductees into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 2024. And yeah, I can already hear the complaints about how such and such an act isn't rock and roll, completely ignoring that for actual generations now, rock and roll has just been shorthand for popular music. Now, I didn't really like Dave Matthews' band in my youth, even though it was basically a crime in my school not to. However, even I can admit they deserve to be in on the merits of the criteria for induction. I don't know that they necessarily meet the criteria for historical significance or influence, but they have been a remarkably successful band. They've had seven straight studio albums debut at number one on the Billboard charts. They've gone platinum over 30 times, have sold over 25 million concert tickets, and somehow translated a jazz fusion jam band sound for arena rock venues. Of course, the quality part is subjective, but they satisfy the success and longevity criteria, which help balance out the argument against their influence. And in the same way... You know, if there were a Hall of Fame for cars, I mean, there kind of is, but if there were a Hall of Fame just for cars, and all the important influential cars are already in, your Model Ts, your Corvettes, your Mustangs, your Chevy Classic 6s, whatever, well, now you can actually start making a case for some more unexpected choices. 
And like Dave Matthews' band, the golf has success, it has longevity, and while it may not be the most influential car ever, it's arguably one of the hot hatch founding fathers. But the golf also exists to be liked. It's a Swiss army knife, it's, it's an omni tool, it wants to be able to do everything for you. To give you turbocharged power with ease of customization if you decide to go that route. And plenty of room and cargo space if you're in the family way, or if you just like having more cargo space and room, you know, it helps you be more social. To give people rides, to take people home. To pile in and go to a movie, go to a bowling alley, I don't know, what do people do? What do people with lives do? And if you take care of it, it will take care of you. Although, <laughs> that's kind of true of all cars, you know? The more we maintain them and the better we maintain them, the more likely it is that they'll stand by us a whole lot longer. Now, the irony of all of this, of course, is that the versatility is what inspires people to do ridiculous things with the Golf, which is how the Golf gets a negative reputation from the more outlandish behavior of the people who drive them. But if I break it down, I feel like the Golf holds a mirror up to us. You know, it kind of reflects us in that the Golf is clearly a car that wants to be populous. It wants to be liked by the most people that it possibly can be. It started out that way, and it still is that way. Just like us, because no matter how we end up as adults, we start out wanting to be liked. And there's a paradox in that, a, a counterintuitive notion, because we care deeply about being liked, but we're liked more when we care less about being liked in the first place. You know, the quickest way to become popular is to treat everybody the same, and maybe try less hard? Ugh. Sorry, I'm kind of just freestyling and spitballing, but... There really is something to just being yourself, right? Because when you are yourself, their decision to like you or dislike you is made on the basis of who you actually are as a person, and not on the foundation of this fake straw man you've created for their benefit. While it may hurt to be rejected for who you are, I would say it's not as bad as being accepted for who you're not. Because it creates this impossible scenario in which you're locked into a lie and you're never allowed to truly be vulnerable because vulnerability means letting the mask slip and allowing people to see the true face underneath. But if you allow yourself to exist without artifice, people will be more responsive. The right ones will be, anyhow. You have a better chance of finding your actual tribe, your kin. And hey, I'm not always as true to myself as I want to be or could be. Sometimes I hold back, I keep things in, and it's natural to do. It's not even like it's something you should be ashamed of. You know, I spent so much time in the early days of making videos for RCR that were just solo me videos, trying to recreate Brian's specific way of making videos, because even while we shared a sense of humor and it came out in the scripts that we would write, our presentation presentation styles were different. And it wasn't until I started just embracing my own, you know, presentation style, my own weird cadence and my tangents and my weird sort of pop culture references and all this other stuff that separates me from Brian. It wasn't until I did all those things that I truly felt like I was having fun making the videos and it felt more true to who I am and it felt like people actually sort of responded to it more, at least more than they did when I was trying to be something I wasn't. Even when we're not as ourselves as we can be, there's still no shame, you know? But I think we should at least work towards being the most ourselves that we can be, because you're who you see in the mirror every day, and it's better to see the real you than the story you tell. Huh. Maybe it's not cars that are the social currency of the world, but honesty. The fact that we can be honest with ourselves and each other. Because the people who are truly valued are the people we trust to be honest with us and with whom we can be honest in turn without fear of hurting them. Those are the people we can be around without stress. And we should always strive to surround ourselves with people who allow us to exist in a state of honesty with ourselves and with them. So to bring this back to the golf after a very, very long walk is to say that while I may not always agree with 
PA dubbers and golf enthusiasts and tuners with their loud exhausts and their pointless eyesore raps or the peacocking that goes with finding yourself at a red light next to a guy who's itching to see if that APR stage one tune did anything, I have to respect them. Because at the end of the day, they're at least being true to themselves, for better or worse, and I admire that. And I'm always going to admire that, even with a little tinge of jealousy, because it means that they truly don't care what other people think, and that has to be the most liberating feeling in the world. I could see myself being happy with something like this, which is really the only criteria I need for whether or not I give a card a positive rating, you know? But by the same token, I couldn't imagine doing half of what PA dubbers do, or any golf enthusiast for that matter not just enthusiasts from Pennsylvania. Even the more modest modifications feel like a whole bunch of added expense when what we have here is a car that feels, straight off the line, like a car that doesn't really need all of that extra dressing. Maybe my mind would change with long-term ownership. But for now, I can't help being surprised by just how formidable a car this Golf turned out to be. Or how weirdly introspective it's making me. Uh... Alright, so I'm going to do things a little bit differently this month, because I realize that on months where the car that I'm reviewing for Race to the Bottom is something positive, there's really no reason for anybody to stick around to the end, because they already know that it's not landing in the bottom five. So there's no real reason to stick around to see where it lands in the list. So I'm going to make this the first month in which I do a top five, but with a caveat. Right now, it's a top four, because while I did do the McLaren 675 LT for Race to the Bottom, I was doing it as sort of a Christmas-themed joke, where, you know, for RCR, we always do something either weird or expensive that we would never normally do. So I'm going to leave it off of the top five, just because I find it hard to believe that it wouldn't just stay at the top of the top five forever. Okay, so now top five, or at least for now, top four. At number four is the Honda CRV. A nice car, a bland car, but a car that's good at what it does and what it's meant to do. At number three, the Chevy Silverado. A truck from a period just before trucks kind of got worse. At number two is this. The Volkswagen Golf GTI Autobahn. It's kind of wild to me that I liked it as much as I did, at least in my opinion. I mean, I think it's crazy that I came into this expecting not to enjoy this car at all and ended up absolutely having my socks knocked off by it. But it's still not my number one. My number one is the 2007 Saab 95 Sport Combi. The last good Saab. With these cars, I'm really just going from my gut. What brought me joy in that moment? And right now, the Saab just, it felt right, you know? Even being part of the GM years, it still felt uniquely Saab. But then this is also kind of weirdly up my alley, because it's economy, and it's quirky, it's unique, it's uncomplicated, it's just everything that it looks like it is. So there you have it. That is my top four. And if you think you have the car that can win the race to the bottom, send me an email at regularcarstheroman at gmail.com. I'd like to thank Jake. Great guy. And before I go, just wanted to say if you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like or subscribing or even sharing the video with someone you know who you think might enjoy it. Any of those things would really help us out. Thank you so much for watching and have a great rest of your week. You've got your golf, you've got the same old GTI you had last year. Wasn't it the Autobahn? One day here and next day gone Didn't need a stage one, two Still the pet boys will see me soon 
versus coops this has lots of room oh and it's a golf gti <laughs> oh i don't have it